Good morning, everyone. If you would, stand with me this morning as we begin our worship service this morning. We're just going to sing our heart out this morning, right? Amen? Come on, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this morning, God. We thank you for your presence. We ask that you would just move in our hearts this morning, God. They would give you glory. We would pour out everything that we have, God, to give you praise. We are so blessed to be in your presence. We're honored to be here in your precious and your glorious name. Come on, everybody said, amen. Come on, let's sing together. Done great. 
this morning. Let's sing it out. Come on. There's no shadow you want. That's it. Come on.
surrender that's why we're here we're here to become better we're here to to know Jesus more we're here to realize that who we are today isn't who we want to be tomorrow but that we want to be greater that we want more let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning He's calling you up front, then great. He's doing a work in your heart right where you are. Just let him. Just allow the Holy Spirit to move in you this morning. Holy Spirit, come. Move in our hearts. We want to be changed. We want to be better than yesterday. We want to be used, God. Your power is present. Your anointing is present.
say his name this morning. Jesus, Jesus, he's our only hope. different than when we came in yesterday, who we were. God, you are worthy. We thank you so much for this time in your presence. Just continue, God, to pour out your spirit and worship this morning. We love you. We thank you. In your precious name, let's shout it out. Amen. Come on, let's give a shout of praise this morning. What an opportunity it is to worship, amen? To lift up our voices in song. Why don't we take that worship to the person next to us this morning? Say hello, give an air high five, give an air hug. We love you. Well, good morning again. How is everybody today? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, my name is Pastor Justin. I am the worship pastor here at Batavia Assembly of God. Um, and uh, today we're going to talk a, a couple things, a couple announcements. But first, I just want to point out, if you look in the back, you'll see our offering plates back there. So if you have tithes and offerings, we'd ask that you would drop those off on the way if you haven't already done that. Uh, but they're back there, as we can't really pass around the plates. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so the kids, okay, they already took off, didn't they? <laughs> so the kids can go, if they haven't already, to their kids' service. Um, 
I got some pretty awesome news this morning. How many were here for our sanctuary remodel? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, so you well know that it was way more than just a transformation in here. Am I right? It was a transformation of our hearts. Man, we grew together. We were all cramped up in John Brown Hall. I, don't, I was telling the first service, I don't think we could have done that now. <laughs> so God knew had his timing. But man, we sure grew together as a, as a team, as a church. And we are so blessed to see that God not only transformed um, what he did in here, but in our hearts as well in preparation for the great things that he had planned for us. Now that was, consider, that was called phase one. And since that time, we have been talking as a board, as a pastoral staff, as a church, about when the next stage is going to come for us to, to embark on our phase two journey. Well, I am so excited to tell you this morning that we have arrived. We are beginning our phase two process. Yes, come on. For those of you who do not know what phase two is, phase two is going to be the transformation of our foyer. But not only that, so phase two was always originally the foyer uh, remodel, but not only that, but we've also uh, had a vision. Pastor Blake has really put, uh, put his heart and effort into creating a space that is good for our kids and for our youth. So if you haven't already seen, our transformation has already begun up in the John Brown Hall. So we're going to create a space that is, that is more appropriate for our kids and for our youth. And, and, and the, the reason we do that is not just for, for us. It's not just for us, am I right? It's, it's for the people that haven't been here yet, the people that are coming, but it's for our future harvest. That's why we do what we do. That's why we create these things. That's why we are so passionate about following the vision that God has put in our heart. So I ask you this morning to please begin to pray. Begin to pray and seek after God's counsel, whether it be praying for, for what's to come, but also praying in your heart of maybe what to give. How to make this thing happen. How to see it come to fruition. Because we are so excited uh, that God is going to do great things here in this church. It's just the beginning. That's going to start in October, if I didn't already say that. But it's an exciting time. So even if the dust is flying in the air and everything like that, we're still going to make our way right here into service and we're going to worship our hearts out. Amen? Amen. All right. So we have a special opportunity this morning. It's a bittersweet thing because we are missing our pastor. Pastor Dan is not going to be here this morning with us. He is visiting his father, which is awesome. And, and so we're going to just pray that he gets the rest that he needs. We're going to pray that he gets the safe travels and mercy. Uh, so if you have, if you're in your day, uh, whatever, maybe tomorrow during the week, just think about Pastor Dan and just put in a prayer for him, okay? Um, we would really appreciate that. He would really appreciate that. So um, we have a speaker here this morning. Before I introduce who he is, um, I'm gonna, he's an evangelist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my experience with evangelists. They're good, don't worry. Um, evangelists, as if you haven't already heard, I, I, I'm a missionary's kid. I grew up in South and Central America. My parents are still missionaries on the field. And uh, throughout our, my experience in ministry, I have witnessed and talked to and heard and been prayed by evangelists all over the world. And I can tell you that it has been a catalyst for me to become the man that I am today. It has become uh, just a staple thing for me and it has given me so much encouragement in, in knowing that I know without a shadow of doubt that my heart is to serve Christ and that my call is to give him everything that I have, no matter what the cost. And, and these evangelists are what gonna br are gonna bring that word. Um, not only that, but one of the other things that we have in common as being missionaries, uh, we had to itinerate. So itinerating is going from church to church to church to church, church all over the place to raise funds in order to continue doing the mission um, that has been called into your life. And evangelists are the same way. Evangelists are here to do what they've been called to do. And they go all over the place. It's exhausting. You wouldn't even realize how, how difficult it can be at times just to travel all over the place. Uh, but God gives you the strength. Amen. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to do something special uh, for our evangelists this morning. Uh, at the end of service, back there where I pointed out our offering was, I'd ask that you, if you have the heart or if you have the call or if you're feeling the urge to, to give a gift, 
to our evangelists this morning. I would urge you to write that out and place it into that offering plate on your way out this morning. Um, please designate um, if that's the plan. If, you, if Please designate and write down it's for the evangelist so that he can get what, 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 uh, what has been given by you. Okay? Awesome. Well, without further ado, we have our evangelist, Richard Rockheim here. Some of you have met him before. Um, I, was, I had the privilege of being here for the first service, and it was awesome. So, so be prepared. Get your seatbelts on because he's coming. Uh, he's been in the, in the ministry for almost 30 years now. Um, so what, what an awesome experience he, he's bringing to the, to, the, to the church this morning, to our hearts. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much further detail on, on, on his story because he's going to share that. Uh, but on behalf of Batavia Assembly of God, let's go ahead and give him a warm welcome this morning. Evangelist Richard Rockheim. Well, praise God. Good morning. As you can see, I have a drinking problem, but it is water. But what a thrill, what a joy, what an honor it is to be with you here this morning. I think I was here maybe four years ago. So what, what an incredible setup with all the new um, aesthetics. That's the key word, isn't it? Aesthetics. And so this is a lot to be proud of. You have a lot to be proud of. Good for you, Batavia Assembly, that you can feel encouraged and blessed and motivated to know that people come through these doors and can sense a great setup. You guys have done your homework. You've set the bar high. You've gone deep. You're serious about making a difference, aren't you? And it shows. But may I also remind you of this. It's not by power. It's not by, uh, by might. Let me say it the right way. It's not by might. It's not by power, but it's by his spirit. So that reminds us that even though the building looks sharp, even though you're going to redo the upstairs and the downstairs and the lobby and the foyer, that's all good. But may I remind you, that in and of itself doesn't change anybody. But how many are thankful this morning for his word? for his presence, for his spirit, for the love that he has for us and the love he gives us for him as well as the love that he gives us one for another. So way to go, Batavia Assembly. I'm excited to be here. Can you tell? I should have taken my riddle and I do apologize. I did not. But we're excited to be with you this morning. I was bummed when I found out that Pastor Dan Sch Schmidt was not going to be here because ironically, when I booked with Sherry, thank God for Sherry, I raved about her in the first meeting. I think she's not here anymore. She was smart not to come back. Of course, Pastor Dan was smart to go on vacation when I came anyway. That's another story. But my point is when I booked with Sherry and Pastor Dan to come, uh, we were excited. I was excited. And, uh, but he, um, a couple weeks ago, I texted Sherry. I said, looking forward to coming. I'll need a hotel. I've got my friend who you'll meet in a moment who's driving me. But I said, I'll probably keep it really simple because most churches in light of COVID are only about an hour service if you will. So I usually sing, but I thought I'm not going to sing, and I haven't been singing for four or five months now. Uh, I was off for three months because nobody was going anywhere with the preaching. Are you with me? Doors were closed. I'm saying all that to say that um, when I confirm things, Pastor Dan got wind from Sherry that I wasn't going to sing. Pastor Dan said, Richard, you got to sing because that's who you are. You sing. So I'm singing now. He's not here. What's up with that? Um, so I had to practice, so I'm just going to share a song, and then my friend, Commander Scott uh, Glassic, you'll get to know more in a minute why I call him Commander Scott. I'll give you a little FYI, him and I are commanders together. Anybody a Royal Ranger fan? Royal Rangers, anybody? In fact, somebody was here in the first server said, he's done Rangers for 50 years. Is he around right now? 50 years he did Rangers. Man, that guy needs a t-shirt or a plaque or an award of some sort. A gift card to Applebee's. Give that guy something. 50 years in rural rangers. If you can do anything for 50 years, especially rangers, uh, you, you deserve some credit. So I'm going to sing. I, I apologize that Pastor Dan wanted me to sing. So if you do want your money back, uh, see Pastor Justin later. You can roll that song. And I picked a song that you know that you can help me, so I want you to sing it. Are you ready? Here we go. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk 
by your side Sing I can only imagine What we'll see When your face Come on I can only imagine Come on, sing Rounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yes, I can only imagine. Come on, sing it like you mean it. Are you ready? Come on, put your hands together. I can only imagine. Sing. When that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I love it. I can only imagine when all I will do by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall will I sing hallelujah will I be able to speak at all I can only imagine yes I can only imagine all right, it gets real high, so I need your help. Please help me. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yes, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Come on, give the Lord a hand this morning, would you? Well, I had rotator cuff surgery. And this is the first church that I'm preaching at with the cast on. And this is a doozy of a cast. I thank God for Velcro. Um, pray for me. I had surgery two weeks ago tomorrow. I really messed up the rotator cuff pretty good. My buddy Scott, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, him and I enjoy fitness and weightlifting and exercise. So I really did it in with the rotator cuff, but I also damaged quite severely my bicep. I had about 25% of my bicep still intact. So it involves screws and bolts and chisels and hammers. Uh, I start rehab in two weeks. Uh, I have been telling people I thank God for prayer and also for Pro, uh, not Pro, is it Prozac? No, that's not good. Uh, help me out, it starts with a P. Percocet, there's my new best friend. Percocet and prayer. And I tell you what, I don't care who you are, when you're hurting, you start to appreciate drugs. I don't care how much you love Jesus and how many scriptures you know, when you're in pain, you're looking for some drugs. I know I did. And I thank God for Percocet. I thank God. I thank the Lord for those who invented Percocet. I thank God for doctors and nurses and yay men. Amen. And how many know God uses doctors and nurses? And I believe that God uses Percocet. Amen. Well, my buddy is here with me. I can't drive because of the Percocet. So uh, I've had people taking me. In fact, Scott's got the job to take me today. Next weekend, I'm eight hours away. We live in Pittsburgh. Next weekend, I'll be driving right by you. I'm all the way in Mechanic, Mechanicsville, New York, near Clifton Park, uh, Stillwater, north of Albany. It's eight hours from my front door. So Scott's thankful he got stuck with just a four and a half hour trip. But Scott is my BFF. Best friends forever. 
Him and I have known each other for 10 years. He's got a wonderful wife and kids. He's going to come and give his testimony. He's a J.C. Penny model. Uh, but he's a great man, so humble. You're never going to meet a guy nicer than him. He makes me look good, and I'm thankful for that. But he is my best friend. We got into town last night. Thank you for putting us at the uh, Holiday Inn Express and Suites. We had a great night together just hanging out and enjoying fellowship. We both have three kids and a wife. And so when I found out that Pastor Dan wasn't coming, I said to Pastor Dan, is somebody still going to take us to lunch? Because we are in no rush to go home. If you have three young kids and a wife, you're in no rush to go home. So we're trying to drag this trip out as much as we can. If somebody wants to take us to dinner, we'll stay in Batavia. Just kidding. But you know what? I wanted to quickly, while it's on my mind, can we give it up this morning for Shannon and who's the, his, Pastor Dan's better half? Am I right? But thank God for Shannon. And is it Gavin or Garrett that's with us? Gavin. I love those names. How can you not love Gavin and Garrett? They are really cool names. I have remembered their names more than my own, own kids' names. So thank you for your leadership. I know that uh, I was all ready to give Pastor or uh, give, give Scott the, the rundown with, with the family here, but I know that Shannon is originally from Canton, Ohio. That's only about an hour and maybe two hours from my front door where I live not far from the Ohio line. So thank God for Shannon. Give Shannon a hand this morning. Well, my friend Scott got stuck with me driving here. We'll head back this afternoon, and he's my best friend and a lot of fun to be around. He's a great man. I know you'll enjoy his story. So would you give Scott a hand this morning? So um, uh, I love Richard very much. I mean, it, it's... It's funny how our relationship started uh, 10 years ago. I retired from the Air Force 10 years ago, um, and I'm from the Poconos. My wife's from Pittsburgh. We actually met in Montana because my wife was in the Air Force as well. Um, and then when I came to uh, the Pittsburgh area, I met Richard and his wife and family. And I'll tell you what, there's a connection there. First of all, he's crazy. He's, he's, he's crazy, and that really, you know, brought our relationship together. Um, but... Whenever This is my second time traveling with Richard. Uh, I drove him to New Jersey a couple years ago, um, and he asked me to drive him because of his surgery, and I said, absolutely. Uh, I love getting away. Of course, three kids away from three kids is fantastic. Uh, my oldest kid just got his driver's license, which is very scary, um, but it was an honor. It's an honor to be here, a privilege to be here, but uh, Richard wanted me to give you my testimony, so I'm going to do that real quick. So first, let me say that Richard's going to preach today, and what he's going to say, I want everyone to really pay attention to, because he's, it's, it's, gonna, it's very impacting. The world today is kind of in chaos. Would everyone agree with that, right? Kind of in chaos. So my life, my first 25 years of my life was in chaos, because I made my own decisions. I did my own thing. It was all about me. I had one life in my mind, one life, and I was going to do whatever I needed to do to have lots of fun and to do my own thing, and no one was going to tell me what to do. And that was the absolute worst decision of my life. So as I lived the first 25 years of my life, I um, joined the military right out of high school. Uh, I got married. That marriage ended pretty quick. And then I thought, that's it. I'm living for me. And my life started to spiral down really low. Like, I was into stuff that should have never been into, did things that I should have never have done. I shouldn't even be alive right now. That's how bad it was. And I remember laying in bed, and I was at the lowest part of my life. I felt so alone, like I had nobody. And I, I said a quick prayer, super quick. I'll never forget it to this day. I said, Lord, please put someone in my life that is loyal and faithful to me. That's it. That's all I said. Wasn't a praying person or anything like that. A week la later, I met my wife, Jody. Jody was a Christian. She was saved. And she took a big chance with me. 
because Christians aren't supposed to be hanging out with non-Christians. So she saw me, and I said, hon, you know, after all these years, we've married 21 years now. After all these years, I said, hon, what did you see in me? She goes, I, I saw you as a project. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, well, how's that project going? She goes, well, I'm not quite done with you yet. <laughs> so the Lord put her in my life without a doubt in my mind. If you do not believe in Jesus, if people on TV or live streaming, if, if there's a doubt in your mind that Christ, the Lord God, is not real, he is so real because he used her as a tool to get to me because I was on a destructive path. And if you would have said 25 years ago that I'd be sitting on, standing on a stage actually giving a testimony to a sanctuary filled with people, I would have said, you're crazy, you're nuts. And here I am, and I taught Rangers with Richard for 10 years, and uh, it's, been, it's been a blessing, a blessing that I don't deserve. I don't deserve anything that I've gotten. The job that I have, the family I have, the friends that I have, the life that I have compared to where I was going is a complete 180 degree turnaround. And I, have, I don't deserve it, it's not because of me, it's because of his love, grace, and mercy. So, what Richard's going to preach to you today, uh, really pay attention, because um, I would like to see everyone, everyone in this world, in heaven one day. The people that you see on TV that are rioting and looting, and they're lost. We don't hate them. They don't know any better. I didn't know any better 25 years ago. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And one thing I'm learning is that it was 25 years that I was lost. The Lord was right behind me. The whole time with his arms like this. And all I had to do was turn around. But I didn't until a certain point where my wife basically came up and slapped me in the face and said, turn around, the Lord's behind you. And I got him now, and I'm not going to let go. So anyway, I'm going to let Richard preach. Thank you for your time. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Commander. Thank you, Commander Scott. I call him Commander Scott all the time. Scotty, Scott. Commander, how many appreciate good friends? Amen. He helps me with all my stuff. There you go. <laughs> you know, there's that phrase, that old saying, and you've heard it, and I'm going to say it again because it's so very true. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Think about it, friends. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. None of us deserve to be alive. None of us deserve to be here. None of us deserve any of what he's done. So all we can say, plain and simple, is God is good. Is he not? Come on. I said, God is good, man. Commander, would you do me a favor and give me my sweat rag? Right on the top, right on the top, there you go. You know your friend is close to you when he gives you a sweat rag. <laughs> Would you pray with me, Father, this morning we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for Batavia Assembly and for Pastor Dan Schmidt and his lovely wife Shannon and the boys. Thank you that you're in our lives, that you're in our midst. Thank you that you are already speaking. You've spoken through the worship. You've spoken as we've even entered into the, into the lobby and into the foyer. You have spoken through the worship. You've spoken through what Scott shared. You're speaking. You're always speaking. You've always got things to tell us, but it's a matter of us being willing to sit, to be still and know that you are God, to slow down, to put a, put a stop to it, to kind of zip it and say, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you want from me? What, what, what are you calling me to do? What are you calling me to, 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 to follow you and to accomplish in my life and it, as I'm here on this planet? And I pray that we would be blessed today, we would be motivated, encouraged. Help us not just to be stirred, but to be changed. Help us not just to say, amen, this is kind of cool, this guy's a little on the crazy side, but Lord, help us to leave different. 
Taking what we hear into the marketplace. Taking what we hear into our homes. That you would be glorified in every life, every family, every marriage, every ministry, every job. Wherever we're at, may we be an example and a witness for you. May we be on fire. May we realize that the time is short, the clock is ticking, that, Lord, you're coming back. And may we realize that our world is a mess. It's a bunch of people going nowhere fast. But, Lord, you're still the answer for the world today. That hasn't changed and it never will. Be blessed, I pray, through your word. And everybody said amen. So thank you all for being here this morning. Those that are watching live stream, uh, do me a favor and still love me even though my hair's got some issues. My wife is trying to cut this all off. And if my wife was here this morning, she would say, Richard, put a sock in it, slow down. You're scaring them. My wife and three kids don't travel with me. Hallelujah. Everybody, hallelujah. I mean, know bringing your kids and a wife is a whole different set of prayer requests. And Scott's got a wonderful wife and three kids. Our families hang out together. Our wives are at the church together. Our service started at 10. It's probably wrapping up, and they're going to go out, I'm sure, somewhere to eat and spend money that we don't have. But I'm thankful for my wife. I met her preaching a tent meeting back in 1996 in the Pittsburgh area. And... Uh, we're now married, so I've often said it was a great tent service. Uh, my daughter, Olivia, is 16, and she's ready to move out and get a job, and we're going to let her. Just kidding. Um, she just got her permit. She's right behind Nathan, who just got his license, Scott's oldest. Our, do- our son, Grant, is uh, just turned 15 in July. He's 6'3". He's a beast. He's eating us out of house and home. He has his own refrigerator in the basement. He's a big LeBron James fan, loves to shoot. I mean, if you, if you, wherever we go, the first question my son Grant has is, is there a basketball net there? Whether it's a church, a restaurant, someone's home, can I shoot? And then our son Brady uh, is 12, and he loves the Lord, and he's, he's a pistol. But I thank God for my family. Again, God is good all the time. How many are thankful this morning for God's goodness? I mean, look at me. I'm a piece of work. In fact, my wife often reminds me that I should be thankful for her because I'm crazy with a lot of issues and very dysfunctional, but my wife is very pretty and very normal. So my wife has helped the world to realize that I can't be all that bad because she married me. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when people meet me, they're like, wow, he's got problems. When they meet the wife, they say, oh, this is your wife. Oh, I guess he's okay because I've got a good wife. He who finds a wife finds a Good thing. Notice it doesn't say he who finds a husband. I'm not sure why that is, but we got to go with it. But I've entitled the sermon, I'll Be Back. I'll Be Back. And when you think about those three words, you probably think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, by the way, I'm a big fan of and met in person in 2002 in Columbus, Ohio. You think about maybe Arnold saying, I'll be back. But guess what? Jesus came up with it. And if you have your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we're going to look at it. And by the way, what a great job the worship team does. Pastor Justin, give these guys a big hand. Man. Beautiful. Guy can sing. Guy has a good, he has a nice contemporary look. See, my wife wished I dressed like Pastor Justin. My wife wished I dressed dressed like this guy. See this guy right here? Stand up. Stand up for you. My wife wishes I dressed like that. Cool looking. But no, what do I do? Look at this. In fact, if I could get the tie on, I would have worn a tie. I can't get a tie on. Is that okay? You still love me, but my wife says, Richard, nobody wears a suit, nobody wears a tie. But um, praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Look at it. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous. Man, should we go on? Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, 
but denying its power. Look at it. Have nothing to do with such people. Now, I may know we could invite a lot of people that don't know the Lord to come in here. I could read that verse again or those verses again, and probably everybody that was in the building would agree that we're living in these days. When you look at all that I just read, you don't have to be a Christian to know that this is going on, and here the Bible was written thousands of years ago, and whammo, bingo, here we are right now. There's nothing new under the sun. We just have CNN and Fox News, but I understand, and we're real, realizing the reality that our world is a mess. Now that same verse, those same verses in the message translation says this, don't be naive. There are difficult times ahead. As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money-hungry, listen, self-promoting, stuck-up, profane, crude, coarse, dog-eat-dog, unbending, slanderous, impulsively wild. How about that one? Impulsively wild. Jesus, help us. Slanders. Savage, cynical, treacherous, ruthless, here's a good one, bloated windbags. I don't even know what that means, but that's not a compliment, I'm sure. Addicted to lust and allergic to God, it says they'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes they are animals. Stay clear of such people. Now stop there. We are living in a crazy, over-the-top, troubled world. And as I put this together, I thought, here we've got riots in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a recession, in an election year. In an election year. I'm not sure how much more we can take. When you look at all the evil in the world, we're certainly headed toward, uh, if you will, a one-world system with credit cards and plastic and computers and the Internet. You look at all the decline in morals and values and attitudes, the violence in schools and the streets and drugs and immorality and abuse. I mean, Scott and I on our way here, Scott and I on our way here, we're just talking about the world we're living in and trying to raise kids. There's no absolutes. There's all these gray areas, whatever feels good, whatever makes sense to you, whatever's convenient, if it fits into your mindset, it's terrible. I think of Matthew 24, verse 36, you don't have to turn there. It says, no one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. Marrying and giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. That's where we're at today. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding a handmill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, that the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you don't expect him. So what are we saying? We don't know when it's going to happen, but we must be ready. You've got to be ready. Can you say Amen. And in the text, it says that Jesus is going to come like, like a thief in the night. How does the thief come? Does he call you or text you and say, hey, I'm coming through the side window at 1130? No. He comes when you least expect it. I read in one of my devotional books the other day, it wasn't raining when Noah started to build the ark. We need to be ready and prepared. I think of the prodigal or the uh, parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, it, and, and we'll, we're not going to read it, but I just want to capture the highlights. And you've read the story of the ten virgins, perhaps. But basically, they all started out the same. They were all given the same opportunity. Some were wise. Some were foolish. Help me out. Some were ready with their oil. Some were not ready. They didn't have the oil. And when you look at that story, there's a lot you could grab but what I love is the reality, the punchline, when you read it, is really this summed up. You can't get to heaven on someone else's commitment. That's what it's talking about. And the idea is that we have to be prepared and ready this morning. 
The bridegroom is Christ, and the church is the bride. Being ready means being prepared for whatever may happen and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. I can't worry about the world and what's going on. My job is to be ready and to keep my eyes fixed on him. My eyes can't be on you, on the who's going to be the next president. My eyes can't be on me, my wife, my kids, our finances, the future, the past, the present, worries, concerns, fear, anxiety, stress. My eyes must be, need to be, should be, and have to be fixed on him and be ready. It's, this isn't rocket science. I want to address in the next few moments, three people that are sitting here this morning, three people that are watching via live stream, because all of you are in one of these three categories, if you will. Number one, I want to talk to those who need God. And I'm a true evangelist, which means I never preach. I've been doing this for, you know, a long time. I went full-time on the road in 1996, graduated Valley Forge, 87, was a youth pastor in Alexandria, Virginia, outside of D.C., worked eight years with Teen Challenge, 88 to 96, in Syracuse. My mother died in 96 of lupus. My mother, catch this, was only 48 years old when she died of lupus. I never met my dad. I have a brother and a sister. God's blessed us with godly wives and husbands and three kids each and the whole bit. But my point is we have to be ready. And God's been good to me. I kind of lost my train of thought, so work with me here. But, but I want to address three types of people. Number one, those who need God. So I've been doing this a long time, so my point is I'm not going to assume that everybody here this morning knows the Lord. So if you've heard this before, you just relax and enjoy it, or laugh at my hair, and my sweat rag, and my waters. But number one, those who need God. Maybe you're here this morning, and you've never accepted Jesus. You're here this morning, and you don't know in your knower. Let me say that again. You don't know in your knower if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. Billy Graham was a master at evangelism. And everywhere Billy Graham ever went, he would say, as he would give the conclusion in the altar call, you may die on your way home tonight. Someone may shoot you in the parking lot. You may get into a car accident. Do you know where you're going to go when you die? Billy Graham always did a great job of reminding people that you don't have time so maybe you're here this morning and you don't know God. Here's a lot of excuses that people have. Are you ready? And this may be one that you have or maybe one that you used to have before you came to the Lord. But I want to address, number one, those who need God in the service. And here's some of the things we tend to say. I'm not ready yet. How many know you're never going to get ready? It's never necessarily going to be convenient for you and fit in your schedule. People say, I need to take care of things first. What is more important than your soul? How about this one? I don't understand it all. Let me tell you something. I've been in ministry a long time. The longer I'm saved, the more I realize how much I don't understand. The more I read the Bible, I don't get it. Anybody here understand everything in the Scriptures? Of course not. That's where faith comes in. What will others think? That's always a good ex uh, excuse for coming to the Lord, what's everybody else going to think about me? You know what I learned a long time ago? I can't live my life concerned about what you think about me. I don't have time for that. Some of you are going to leave and say, this guy's got problems. This guy needs to go to great clips. Now, you can, you can think it, and you can tell me it's okay. I still love you. But we can't worry about what other people think. Come on, say amen. I'm not sure. That's a good one. How about this one? I need to get my life in order before I come to God. That's a good one. I need to get my life in order before I come to God. That's like saying I need to wash up before I take a bath. Somebody once said this, all roads, all roads lead to eternity, but only one road leads to heaven. See, we're all going to go somewhere with somebody forever, either heaven or H-E double hockey sticks. Somebody put it this way once, hell is full of believers, people that didn't believe they needed to take God serious. People often say this too, how can a loving God send people to hell? That's a really good question, but I've got a pretty good answer, and I know you've already heard this before. He doesn't send you to hell. You send yourself. He gave you a compass. He gave you a GPS. He gave you a road map. He gave you his promises and his spirit. He teaches you the truth through his word. Uh, he gave us a fire escape uh, route. 
So if you end up going to H-E double hockey sticks, it has nothing to do with God sending you there. And here's the mystery of God's love. God made you, created you, and gave you breath, but he also gave you, watch this, a free will. You reap what you sow. Just like Scott and I on our way here, we were talking about being parents with kids. We're trying to raise our kids to love God, instill principles in our kids to love God. But guess what? Our kids one day are going to make a decision when they're out of the home to do the right thing when mom and dad aren't around. Are you with me? So every day we got to do the same thing. So my prayer this morning is for those that are in this service that have never asked the Lord in, I pray that that would change. You know, people often say this one too, God, leave me alone. I don't care about Batavia Assembly. I don't care about this preacher. I don't care about God. I'm good. I've got my own life. Just like Scott said, he was on his own path, which was the biggest mistake he ever made, but yet God turned it all around, praise God. But my point is, when you look at your own life, we often want to think that, uh, you know, we're just going we're, we're gonna to do whatever we want. And so we say, God, leave me alone. I'm not interested in Christianity. I'm not interested in God. I'm okay. I'm good. That's always a big lie. I'm good. You ever hear that one? I'm good. In fact, here's a big lie too. People think if you dig down deep, there's good in there. If I just dig down deep, there's good in us. No, there's not. Your best day is filthy rags. Your best day. You can dress the part, have your Bible with your name on the front, lift your hands as high as you can and sing all the songs. It doesn't get you to heaven. It doesn't mean God loves you anymore. Your best day is still filthy rags. It's by his grace that we're redeemed, forgiven, and we go to heaven. It's not a matter of you and I being good. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a preacher and I drove four and a half hours with Scott and I went to Bible school. That means nothing. I'm ordained. That means nothing to me. Ordained. What's that? If you know anything about the Assemblies of God, I'm ordained. All that means to me is i gotta, I got to pay more money to the Assemblies of God to be ordained. It's actually an added expense in our budget for me to be able to say I'm ordained. Doesn't make me sleep better. And it certainly doesn't impress God. But people say, God, leave me alone. And you know what? That's the worst thing about hell because God's going to leave you alone forever. I read this. A man proudly said, I've gone to church only two times in my life. The first time they sprinkled me with water, the second time they sprinkled me with rice. A hearer of the conversation added, and a third time when they sprinkle you with dirt. Revelations 22, verse 7 says, Behold, I come quickly. I'm reminded of a young preacher who was preaching on that scripture, Behold, I come quickly, Revelations 22, 7. And so he said that phrase, that scripture, three times, each time with more gusto and more umph. He said, behold, I come quickly. And the second time he said, behold, I come quickly. And the third time he really got into it. A young preacher said, behold, I come quickly. And he was in the front there, and he tripped over his own foot, landed on the lap of a lady in the front row. And he looked at her and said, I'm very sorry, ma'am. And she said, well, it's okay. You warned me three times. (laughs) Secondly, I want to address those who need to get right with God. So watch this. Some of you are here and you've never invited Jesus in your life. I was 17 years old. My home church in Baltimore, Maryland, that's where I'm from. The pastor gave an altar call. I couldn't even tell you anything he preached on. But when I heard him say, if you need Jesus, come forward, I went forward. In 1981, I got saved. My mother got saved through Charles Stanley on the radio. My mother got saved in the car. (laughs) She never even went to church. She became a born-again Christian in the car, praying a sinner's prayer with Charles Stanley on the radio. Can you imagine? So maybe you're here. You're a nice person. You're attractive. you got a nice job. you got a family. You, you, you're good. But yet you've never invited Jesus. I can't do it for you. What do you got over here? You got the Darien Lake, right, an amusement? You can't get into Darien Lake unless you have a ticket. Do you, do you have a ticket that says, I've accepted Jesus? I've been washed in the blood. I've asked him to come into my life. I've repented. How many know that's a forgotten word, the word repent? How many know that repent's a good word? Repent means turn, go the other way. Yes. Because when you repent, there's healing, there's washing, there's cleansing, there's beautiful things that happen when we repent. So maybe you're hearing you say, you know what? I need to ask Jesus. And in a few moments, the worship team's going to come. We're going to just have opportunity to respond where you're sitting or standing or you want to come up. Not a problem. Secondly, I want to address quickly those who need to get right with God. See, some of you are here, and you're a Christian. You're born again. You're saved. 
No doubt about it. I'm not arguing. But you're not right with them. And you know what? You know it. God knows it. And probably people that are close to you know it as well. How many know God will speak to you and you just know and you're knower? How many know God loves you too much to let you stay the same? So maybe you're here and you're born again, but you're not living the way you should. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus happy with how you're living? Simple question. You know the answer. Jesus made it clear in Revelation 3.14. These are the words of the amen, faithful and true witness, the rulers of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you were lukewarm nor hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You ever read a scripture that scares you? That's one for me. That, this, that kind of verse. I don't want God to be spitting me out. So the idea is what the Lord's saying this morning here in this service is, be hot or cold, be for me or be against me, but get out of the way of being in the middle because it messes it up for everybody. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm not interested. Well, we love you and we're praying for you. But if you're here this morning and you know that you know the Lord, but yet you're not living the way you should, which we're going to talk about here now, I want you to be honest with yourself, honest with God. You know, I learned a long time ago, if you can't be honest in church, where can you be honest? If this venue here is in a place where you can be yourself, then where are you going to be yourself? Can you say amen? The Bible reminds us that God is looking for a church without spot or wrinkle, meaning people that are willing to look at the things that are not right and deal with them. Doesn't the Bible say that judgment begins in the house of God? And as Scott mentioned earlier, our world's a mess. But guess what? The world's a mess because they don't know any better. Hello, friends. They're lost. Remember when you were lost and now you're found? You were blind, but now you see? Isn't it a great thing to know that you're not lost anymore? But the world we live in doesn't know any better. But you and I do know better. That's why judgment starts with us. How many know that coming to church is not about entertainment? Coming to church is not a social gathering. But we come to church to change, to be convicted, to be set free, to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And to experience the great commission in our heart to go out in the byways and highways and byways and make a difference for the Lord. Can you say amen? And then lastly... I want to address those who need to come back to God. So there are those that don't know the Lord. And you know what? Let me tell you this real quick. This whole service, everything that we've done today is worth it if one person in this meeting comes to Christ. Absolutely. Every ounce of money that has gone into everything you look at and see. I love these crosses, man. That's, that's some cool stuff. Everything we make an investment in, Pastor Justin captured it earlier. You guys have been working. It's brought you as a family together even more. But the whole goal is to reach the lost. So maybe you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord. I pray that today, because the Bible says that today is the day of, yeah, today. Not tomorrow, because guess what? You don't have tomorrow, man. We don't have the next second unless he says you can keep breathing. Anybody get up this morning and think about your heart pumping? Whoa, come on now. So those that need God, I pray that you would make a prayer available to God today. Secondly, those who need to come and make things right with God. And then thirdly, I want to address quickly those who need to return to God. Some of you are backsliding. You know what that means? You've gone away from the Lord. And I learned a long time ago, backsliding is one of the easiest things to do. You know why? Don't pray. Don't go to church. Don't read the Bible. Don't fellowship with believers and be accountable. Don't be a part of something that's bigger than you, and it's a matter of time. One of the things that I learned over the COVID-19 lockdown is how much, we, how much we need to be together. How many felt the effects of us not being together? That weren't you longing to get together again? Because we bring all bring something to the table when we fellowship. That's why church is important. That's why fellowship and accountability is important. And stimulating one another, loving on one another, and certainly hearing the word, being prayed over, being prayed for, learning how to be challenged and get charged up. So in other words, the most miserable people I've come to realize in, on the planet are not those who aren't saved. It's actually those who are backslidden. Those are the people that are the most miserable because they, they know, like the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. They know that God is good, and yet they've gone away from God. Of course, the big argument is, well, 
Can you lose your salvation? That's always a big question. And guess what? I'm going to tell you right now, you can. And I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to prove it. God never stops loving you. But it's a relationship. And if it was a shoe in that once saved, always saved, was the case, why would the Bible talk about taking up your cross, walking in the Spirit, denying your flesh, crucifying yourself daily, putting on the armor, renewing your mind, keeping your eyes on the Lord? There's a battle and a fight that we're in. Why in the world would the Bible be filled with the challenges we face if it was like, I'm saved, wonderful, and I just do whatever I want? I mean, honestly, even as a parent, you're going to let your kids just do whatever they want just because? I mean, no. There's a consequence. And so, yes, God loves us. My wife and I have been married for going on 21 years in December. Next to being saved, my wife is the best thing that ever happened to me. My wife and I work at our marriage. People don't work at things. And sometimes people give up on things because they're not willing to pay the price and work on it. Any day I choose, I can leave my wife or my wife can leave me. My point is we choose not to because it's wrong. We choose to serve the Lord because it's right and we know if we go away from him, it's not a good thing. But understand something. We have to make a decision. The Bible even says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Is it easy to be a Christian? Do we have challenges? Are some days better than others? Of course. We don't base it on the weather, our circumstances, how we're feeling, what came into the offering. We don't base it on our circumstances or other things that we're going on and through. We base it on the fact that we serve God and love him, and he loves us by faith, and we're not giving up on God because God hasn't given up on you. Jesus even said, let this cup pass. But then in the same breath, he said, not, not, not my will be, but your will be done. Are you with me? I think of Jonah. There's four chapters in the book of Jonah, not a whole lot to read. But here's a guy that was called to go to Nineveh. Did he do it? No. And how many know that when you don't follow God, it's all downhill? How many know when you don't follow God, it's all downhill? And I'm going to prove it. He's told to go to Nineveh. Instead, he rebels. How many know you can't run and hide from God? He goes down to Tarsus, then down to the ship, then down in the ship. Some of the guys there on the ship realize, you're running from God, aren't you? And he said, yeah, matter of fact, I am. And then Jonah's like, look, the only way we're going to get rid of this storm and waves, you gotta, you got to get rid of moi. you got to throw me over. So he goes down to Tarsus, down to the ship, down in the ship, then down into the water. And then God provides a fish. The Bible doesn't say it was a whale. I think it was maybe a northern pike with teeth. I don't know. But how many know the whole idea is God provided a fish, and all of chapter 2 of Jonah is Jonah brushing up on his prayer life. And then in Jonah chapter 3, it says, and the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many know we serve a God of second chances? And when you don't live the way you should for God, it is all, all downhill. But God has provided a fish for you, if you will. God has provided, even with Scott's story with his wife, God will provide a window where he will get your attention. In fact, months ago, I preached a sermon on Mary and, Mary and Martha because when you look at the whole lockdown, we were locked down for three months. My wife and kids, we didn't go anywhere. Now, my wife works at the VA, so she was essential. She never missed a beat. They had to take her temperature every day. But my wife was at work with me and the kids were locked down. My son Brady almost lost it. He said, Mom, Dad, please buy us a trampoline. He was, he was losing it. So we spent a lot of money on the trampoline because trampolines were a lot of money a couple months ago because everybody was buying them. My son Brady was like, Dad, is the trampoline here today? They were going crazy, man. But that was a great time to really slow down, wasn't it? And to spend time with the Lord. So there's no doubt about it. Would you stand? The worship team is going to come. You know, maybe you need to come back to God. Maybe you've been hurt by leadership, pastors, a missionary. Maybe you've been hurt by some of the decisions that others have made and things that you've made and you're still living some of the repercussions. Maybe you've got some bad choices you're dealing with and some maybe hanging around the wrong crowd. Some of you have addictions. I worked eight years with drug addicts. In fact, we just had Teen Challenge come to our church on August 9th and do a service there. Maybe you've got some habits. Maybe you need to get clean with God and make some adjustments in your agenda. 
How many know that being a Christian is not about doing, doing this? God, here's what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. If you want to come along, that's great. Bring some water in a backpack and some good shoes. And if you want to take care of me while I'm doing my own thing, that's wonderful. You can join me. No, 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 no. Being a Christian is about saying, God, you're the boss. It's not about me. It never has been and never will be and should be. How many know it's about him? So if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, we're going to pray in a moment. Secondly, you're here and you know the Lord, but your life isn't what it should be and needs to be and wants to be and what you want it to be. And you say, you know what, I got I to I gotta make some changes. Hey, we're, we're going to go to lunch, Scott and I and some of the leadership that gets stuck entertaining us. I feel bad for all of you that have to take us. Not a lot of people like to be in public with me. And then we're going to be going home. And this service will be over. And look at me. There's a window right now. Are you understanding this? In fact, everybody look up. Just look up. God took your picture. And everything that you've heard, you're accountable for. Is this serious business? You better believe it. Guess what? This is life and death. Live stream. People watching. I don't know what you've gone through or where you're even at watching this. But this is serious business. God loves you. He's coming back. What is your job? To know him, to serve him, to fix your eyes on him, to be ready in your heart, your mind, your attitudes, your lifestyle. Our world's a mess, but Jesus isn't a mess. Our world's in chaos, but Jesus is a God of order and love and structure and principles and value. And if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, that will happen. He's a good, good father as Chris Tomlin sings the song. So if you need Jesus, you're going to pray. If you need to get things right with God, you're going to pray. And then lastly, if you're here and you've gone away from God, some of you have been running. And again, that eternal security, I don't buy it. The person who led me to the Lord in 1981, his name is John is no longer serving the Lord. This is back in the 80s. The person who led me to the Lord and he invited me to come to the youth group every Friday and then years later, I became the drummer. Our youth group was 300 kids. We had a church of 1,000 back in the 80s. People modeled, people modeled our church for church growth. Earl Baldwin is a household name with, with Valley Forge. He was the interim president in between Ashcroft and Don Meyer. This is facts. Our cantatas were huge. We had 10 bucks to go to our own musicals at our church. We had big names. We had Jim Baker and all the top, Petra, DeGarmo and Key, Amy Grant, Twyla Parrish, Sandy Patty. We had all of them at our church. Big place. And the person who led me to the Lord and changed my life to this day is not serving God. So don't tell me you can't go away from God because you can. If it, if it wasn't possible, there'd be no love relationship. It's the same thing with saying Jesus could have gotten out of the cross. Look at me. He could have gotten out of the cross. But guess what he did? He said, Father, I'm going to go to the cross because of my love for you and my love for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his own son. So what a beautiful story. So would you pray with me? I want all of us to pray. You may know the Lord, and these prayers that we're going to pray, you've already accomplished and covered it. I get that. But I want you to pray it anyway, because what's the big deal, right? Would you pray out loud with me? And if you're here without Jesus, I'm going to ask you to mean this in your heart. Please, do it for yourself. Come on, man, this is serious stuff. Say, Father, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name, I want to follow you now. I'm not in charge. And that's a good thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, secondly, some of you need to repent and clean some things up. Can you say amen? Would you all pray this prayer? And I'm praying it too. Father, forgive me for my sins. I haven't been living right. I haven't been in the Word and in prayer. I haven't been faithful to what you called me to do. And I know that I've let you down. And I'm sorry. In Jesus' name. Amen. And then thirdly, maybe you're here and you say, you know what? God doesn't really love me. I've made too many mistakes. I can't come back to God. Yes, you can. It's only a prayer away. It's a step away. So would you all repeat this prayer? Say, Father, I've gone away from you. I've done my own thing. 
But today that's going to change. I ask you to help me. Like the prodigal son, I'm coming back to the Father with the arms open. So, Lord, I know you love me, and I ask you to give me a second chance. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand this morning? So Pastor Justin's going to come with the worship team and close us out. Uh, I know the altars are open, and he'll encourage you to come. Scott and I are up here as well. So don't be, hey, I'm, I'm convinced that lives are changed in these moments. So don't be so quick to go out to lunch. Don't be so quick to just leave. Let the music play and just take some time with God. Can you say amen? Oh 
Just going to continue worshiping this morning. We'll open up the doors here in a moment. And if you feel released to go, you can go. But let God do a work in your heart this morning. Let that surrender sink in. Let's be changed this morning. are still open. Let's just surrender our hearts this morning. Let God do a great thing. God, I want to seek after you more. I want more of you, Jesus.
within his presence that we're changed through the power of the Holy Spirit. Kings and their king. 
kingdoms are standing amazed here in your presence we are
keep seeking. Keep wanting more this morning.